Cell Systems Presentation, Section 1. So, what is a system? One definition is a set of things working together as parts of a mechanism or an interconnecting network. Cells are parts of lots of systems. First, each cell is its own system. The organelles, the cell structures, the biochemistry all work together as parts of a mechanism, allowing the cell to survive. Next, cells interact with other cells, whether they are cells of the same type or different types. So they are part of a bigger cell system. Finally, cells interact with the ecosystem in which they live. And part of that ecosystem are the other cells, but part are the abiotic factors like chemicals, temperature and light, energy. So here we have a stack of three systems, all of which cells are a part of. So how many cell systems are shown? Three. Let's review some of what we've learned already about cells so we can understand how they fit into each of these three systems. Go ahead and pause this video and answer the questions based on what you remember. And then you can come back here to check your answers. Before you come back, check out this very interesting video that shows you the life of a cell. This will help to prove that cells may be the simplest form of life, but no life is simple. I'll see you back here in a few minutes. Welcome back. Hopefully you watched this video and wrote your two observations or questions about the life of a cell, what it looks like from inside the cell as it goes about its business. The review questions that you answered have been answered here, so feel free to go through and check your answers by pausing the video to look at the screen or taking a screenshot right now so you can look and see if your answers match. The cell parts in a prokaryote you'll notice are fewer than those in a eukaryote because eukaryotes have membrane-bound organelles like mitochondria and chloroplasts and vacuoles. Our core four organic macromolecules include nucleic acids, proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. And DNA is a nucleic acid that codes for cell function and adaptations like cilia, flagella, and pseudopodia, which are three adaptations for movement. How does, they do, how does the DNA do that? Well, the DNA is the code that tells the cell which proteins it can make and how to make them. And those proteins do the cell work, including allowing the cell to have specific adaptations for the ecosystem in which it lives. On the next slide, we have a couple of examples of cells doing some work. Whether the cell is a system of just one cell or a group of cells, which might be a population or colony, if it's a group of unicellular organisms, or it might be called a tissue or an organ if they're working together, or if it is a system of an ecosystem, which is a living community and the physical non-living environment, including the population, which is a group of the same species, it doesn't matter which system, all living systems need two things, energy and materials. And when we say materials, what we really mean is matter. So let's look at energy and materials as kind of our theme, our thread that connects all of these systems and explains so much about cells and their adaptations and their lives. Here we see a white blood cell chasing bacteria within the blood system. It's pretty crazy, right? You see the red blood cells, white blood cells getting bumped aside by this very active white blood cell, this macrophage, which is heading out after these tiny little bacteria, which gives you a good sense of how much smaller 
bacteria are than eukaryotic cells. And here's my question. There's no wrong answers because you're just hypothesizing. How does this white blood cell get the energy it needs to move? And where did it get the materials to make a cell so big and so squishy that it can just flip through these red blood cells? Here we have another example. A single seed develops into a big tree. Again, no wrong answers here, just hypothesize. How did it get the energy to grow? Remember, the seed's underground. It doesn't have access to the sun yet. And where did it get the materials to go from something so small to something so big? Add your hypotheses here in the four answer places. No wrong answers, so don't panic. Just think about it, pause the video if you need to, and then come on back. Let's take a look at energy and materials and think about what does life have to overcome in order to get the energy it needs. I'm going to call these life's energy problems. Problem number one. Here's the sun. It releases tons of energy. Enough energy for all living things, but there's a problem. Most living things cannot directly use energy from the sun. It has to be transformed to a form of energy the cells can actually use. Second energy problem. Cells can transfer energy from the food that they get or make, mostly carbohydrates and lipids like fats and oils, but when they transform their food into energy they can use, a lot of the energy that was in the food gets lost as heat with every transfer. So, for example, when you look at a food, um, a, what we call a an energy pyramid based on trophic levels, which are feeding levels, uh, you will see down here at the bottom, we've got our primary producers getting their energy from the sun. That's 100% of the energy available at this snapshot of the ecosystem. But the things that eat all of these grasses and other photosynthetic organisms only get 10% of that energy. Just 10%. What happened to the other 90%? It got lost as heat. And even the producers were not able to gather 100% of energy from the sun as they converted, transformed that energy. A lot of it got lost as heat but they still represent 100% of the energy that will be able to move up. And only 10% of that goes to the things that eat the producers, which we call our primary consumers. And then there are the things that eat our first level consumers. They only get 10% of the 10%, which is just 1%, because 90% of that transfer gets lost to us as heat. And by the time you get to the top, there's really very little energy left, which helps explain why there's so few things at the top of an energy pyramid. So let's think about this. What two biomolecules provide chemical energy? It's a review from something we've talked about before. They are the carbohydrates and the lipids. Remember that group of four families of chemicals called biomolecules. Those are the two that give off energy. Next question. Photosynthesis is a process that transfers solar energy and builds carbohydrates, which are one of our energy macromolecules. How does this help solve life's energy problems? Well, it helps us to take energy from the sun, which cells can't use directly, and give cells something that they can, which is the carbohydrate. So it transforms energy from the sun to a form of energy cells can use, carbs. Now let's think about the materials and matter that all systems need. What problems, what things do, does life have to overcome? 
The first is that just like energy, matter cannot be created nor destroyed, but living things need a constant source. They need a constant source to build biomolecules. They need a constant source to grow, but they cannot create the atoms they need. They have to get them from somewhere. Something doesn't come from nothing. Problem two, unlike energy, which can come from the sun, so we've got this outside easy source, we don't have that for matter. All of the atoms that we have on this earth are on this earth, with the exception of new atoms that arrive by things like meteors. And that matter is being used. It's locked into living things as part of the material that makes up living things. For example, in this diagram, you can see what percentage of you each element represents. So how can we get over the materials and matter problem? First, cells can transport materials into the cell from the environment. How does this help? Instead of creating them, it allows cells to access material it cannot create. Decomposers like fungus use chemical digestion to break down dead organisms into simpler free chemicals. How does this help? It unlocks the material that was bound in the organism so that it can be reused. Whether one cell, many cells, or a community, one of the solutions is going to involve chemical reactions. So when we're addressing energy and matter problems, chemical reactions are essential. We're going to look at four chemical reactions that really help solve energy and matter problems when they work together. They are photosynthesis, respiration, digestion, and transport. We see some diagrams over here of these processes. What is the first source of energy shown in this diagram? It is the sun up here at the top, introducing the energy. What is the final source of energy? It is ATP. So we move from solar energy, sun energy, light energy to ATP, which we'll study more later. What about matter? How does transport and digestion help? Here we see an amoeba and it's eating something. You might want to go to present to make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. But it's using its pseudopodia to surround and ingest food. Did that food come from inside or outside of the cell? It came from outside. Did the digestion build or break down the matter? It broke it down so it could be reassembled and used in a different way. I hope this was helpful. I'll see you next time. Have a great day.